This is not a film about ska. This is not a film about mod. This is not a film about DC hardcore. This is a film about the Siren Six from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bands today can reach a global audience of millions with the click of a button. But not so long ago, if you wanted to reach an audience, you had to be on a major record label. And to get the attention of a major record label, you needed to be in New York or Los Angeles. All right, welcome to Skank Pogo Slam. I'm Daniel, your host. I'm here with the Siren Six. They just played a rad set for us. Yeah. Okay, you guys are originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you just moved to Hollywood. Yes. Why? We want to get famous. I ask you for your evil luck. You give it to me anyway. I ask you for your evil luck. You give it to me anyway. Got me right, right. You guys invented ska. You guys, you guys are to ska as Al Gore is to the internet. <laughs> Coming to you from the 612, from the top of the 612. It's the sound from the underground. It's the sound that the man does not want you to hear. It's the sound that you need to hear. The year is 1998. The Siren Six just packed up all their worldly possessions and are moving to Hollywood to pursue a record deal. This is the story of how they came together and how they fell apart. I met the Siren Six through my friend Mickey, who knew Celeste, who knew the six. One night we were all hanging out and someone's like, oh, there's a party at this apartment. There's this band and they all live together. Just, you know, I was like, cool, they have an apartment. I think that's really great. And we came close to them, very close, you know. Or I like to think so. And so I'm going as a merch girl on their tour. And I'm gonna bring this little camera with me. Right? Yes. Okay, so talk to me. What's up, Julie? Let me back up a little. I want to contextualize you against your room. Okay, this is my room. It's there? a mess. Alright, let me tell you something. You know, this is my bed. <clears throat> I already a mess needs bed. Yeah. Isn't that ghetto? <laughs> you want to see this is my bed? May it be ominous. Ominous? Yeah. What does that mean? With the LA plan, the plan was that we would be there in, for two months and then move to New York for two months. <laughs> that was the plan. The plan? <laughs> yeah, the plan was to move to LA and <laughs> move to LA and get a record deal. And then we were gonna come back. The whole thing was like we were gonna come back. It was a very simple plan. You want to sit on a rock? Yeah, that's good. Is my hair all right? No? Tell me the history of the Siren Six. We've heard this like six times. The history of the Siren Six. We started as Stinkfish. I started playing with Frank and Jeff in high school. Jeff joined like his summer after eighth grade. Been with Nate and Frank for a while. We started the band with another one of our friends named Tim, who played the bass. Met John through another band. John was in this other band, the Pacers. The Pacers broke up and I started my record label, which was called Mr. White Records. My first band was gonna be Stinkfish, and I was gonna produce, I was gonna be like producer. And I did, I produced it. Their horn players were kind of sucky at the time. Maybe they're great now, I don't know. And they wouldn't do a tour, which I had booked. And they were like, oh, I guess we can't tour. And I'm like, fuck it, I just booked this tour. That's when we got John and Kevin in the band. We started getting a little more serious. We moved from Madison, Wisconsin to Minneapolis, where we lost the bass player. Tim didn't really want to move with us. He's no longer playing music. He's working at Best Buy. All right, so, <laughs> moving on. Any people with minds like us who are interested in like making it big, 
you know, mm-hmm. go to Minneapolis, because Minneapolis is a, a big cosmopolitan city. When we were looking for a bass player, we didn't want to put out an ad in the paper, because that just tends to attract dorks. Me and John would go to Minneapolis all-age dance party night at First Avenue. We would just like look through the crowd for guys that we thought looked cool, or girls that we thought looked cool, or guys with really hot girlfriends. There was a dance going on, where you know young teenage girls dance all night long. Anyways, I was sitting at a table, you know, and, you know I was I was a dirty kid at the time. I was kind of you know dressed down, wearing like a hooded sweatshirt. This is the key word. I was wearing a trench mouth shirt. He was wearing a trench mouth t-shirt. No, you you like trench mouth? That's insane. I mean, they're like one of my favorite bands. And we said, hey, you know, what's up? Do you play the bass? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and... <laughs> Why is that funny, Frank? It's just funny. Why is that funny, Frank? Because if you ask JC any question, he says, yeah. But right. anyway... <laughs> Yeah, we really did have a thing, I think, in Stinkfish, you know, where we had the name that was silly, and we had a very whimsical kind of thing going. By the time we moved to Minneapolis, we felt like we weren't just a high school band anymore. Around that time is when we changed our name to the Siren Six. We decided we were going to try a totally new sound. We were bored with what was happening as far as ska and reggae music. Ska? Like the music? Ska? Ska. Scott. It all began with the Scottalites. I think they had the first breakthrough of that kind of Caribbean, that salsa beat, and that rock steady feel on the guitar, doing the upbeat on the guitar, accenting the two and the four. So then that goes into like the two tone movement specials selector and the shows are these dance hall shows of just like people grooving and shaking and skanking all of that stuff was laying down the groundwork for the third wave and we didn't really like third wave ska those third wave bands they're terrible and they're completely destroying like the art form and so we were going to be like, well, okay, we can do it different, but still to stay true to first wave and second wave sky. We wanted to be part of something a little bit cooler than just the whole ska thing. And yeah, and John did have a big part of it. John was a little more refined in his tastes, and he introduced us to a lot of great music. As we grew, the bands that we were into were all the hardcore bands at the time. None Left Standing, Promise Ring. None Left Standing was a hugely influential. That, that song, Laura. How can you live with yourself? How can you live with yourself? That was more powerful and felt and just how loud those guitars were. You got to stand right in front of the freaking Marshall half stack. That was more powerful than any drug I, I could think of taking. And we started to kind of incorporate, I think, some of that stuff. Now, I remember when Nate came in with Begin, that was very inspired. Everyone's asking, what you gonna do with your life? How you go to sleep at night? With empty hands. There were a lot of really cool elements to that song. There's something slightly off about the, the timing of where the chords come in. That's a very Pixies thing. Obviously, that riff is a direct reference to uh, Waiting Room. And that was really part of our transition to doing cooler stuff.
recorded our CD, The Voice of the Built-In Promise. We wrote it in like two weeks. We had a rehearsal space and we practiced like every day for, for like 10 hours a day. Then we started touring. We toured for a while while we went to college and school. And you know, we did a tour of Japan. Thank you, Arigato, Arigato, Tokyo! I don't know, we always kind of talked about making a move because mm -hmm. Minneapolis was not quite big enough. We dropped out of school for the band, we don't have anything else in our lives. We've pretty much sacrificed many of our personal relationships, so we were like, let's just go all the way. When it came time to move to L.A., Kevin decided to stay in Minneapolis. I started getting a couple emails from John, and then I got one that said, I think it was t it was entitled, um, the email, and it was like, so, what are you doing now? Do you want to join the Siren Six? We're uh, moving to LA. I remember walking around my house just going like, oh my god, oh my god, the Siren Six just asked me to join, oh my god, what, oh my god, and I was going nuts, and I probably kind of decided like that day, like, sure, I'm going to do it. A week before, people would call me up, they're like, are we really moving to L.A.? Yeah, we're really moving to L.A., pack your bags, and, you know, I want you to be ready to leave on this day, and they're like, wait, why do you want me to leave on this day? Because we're moving to L.A. <laughs> and it, it was just insane. We didn't have any apartment hookups ahead of time. We actually left without a place to, to live, and that was really scary. It was probably one of the more stressful periods of my life, not knowing what was going to happen. We got there and, and we were living out of our friends' houses and really bad hotels. The fact of the matter is you can't get an apartment in L.A. unless you've lived in L.A. before or you're just rich and you can throw down a lot of cash in mm -hmm. front of them. Because we had no references, we had no jobs, nothing. We had to lie about everything. Luckily, three weeks into it, we found just a really nice landlady who trusted us. And in true Henry Miller style, we screwed her over every month after month after month. We have not paid her rent on time. And yeah. Just terrible. And that's at Central. Yeah, that's Central. Right. So we found our Central, and that was pretty nice. It's a karate kid type house, pool, and real crappy, you know, old people. We stayed there the first week, there wasn't electricity. We'd sleep on the floors uh, in our sleeping bags, but it was just amazing to finally have a place to stay. We'd have like teams go out and scavenge for furniture, and I mean, most of our, for all of our furniture, we haven't paid a dime for any of our furniture. We all found it on the street, or people gave it to us, and stuff like that. I met the band the first night they moved to LA, I think, yep. at a Swingers restaurant. All the dudes here were really big on going from one late night diner to the next. Most of us never eating or drinking anything, but just kind of sitting in booths all over LA. It felt instantly like like the dudes belonged out in LA, like with our group of bands that we had going out here, you know. Of course, there's Phantom Planet, Karen's Flowers, Teen Heroes, they were around. By the end of the night, I feel like we knew that we were all gonna be great friends. There was definitely a time in my life when the Siren Six apartment was was central to my social life. No, no <laughs> pun intended, actually. We called it central for a reason. I didn't think central was fucked up. But I thought fucked up was fabulous. Central was amazing. You have footage from Central? Almost every night, no matter what I'd been doing previously, I would end up at the apartment. It was like an unofficial after hours. <laughs> that living situation was extraordinary, too. It was really amazing. Nate, shower's free. Okay. Yeah, I gotta take a shower, Mara. I know. Why don't you walk towards here? Oh! Okay, this is so it's gonna be like that. 
the mention of starving and starvation. I, I remember that so clearly. Like, I, I felt starving when I hung out with you guys. No, I, I just remember eating the most disgusting stuff at Central. Yeah, and it was communal. So I remember ramen burritos, which is kind of an insane idea. I remember getting in trouble for using too, too much cheese, because cheese was such a valuable <laughs> commodity. Me and JC, I think, invented this dish called the Messy Mess, which was basically a spaghetti sauce sandwich. <laughs> you would take like two pieces of bread, toast it, and then maybe there would be some cheese in it, and spaghetti sauce and mayonnaise, and then you put it in the microwave. Also making the move was the Siren Six's friend Dan. Dan Bacchus, can we have a word, please? Mm -hmm. What do you do, Dan? I run a record label, Shabbly, with John. What's it called? Um, Kingpin Records. Dan named it. It's a good name. Oh yeah, it's one of the best I've heard. I'll just, I'll just talk a little bit about Dan and, and my feelings about Dan, which is I've just never met anyone that is just so pleasant to talk to and can talk to fucking anybody. He could just make shit happen. He really could. He was going to be a big part of the whole thing. More rich. Show me the money. More rich. More rich. In the Siren Six Days, bands were getting gigantic deals for a million dollars. So I think that's what we were trying to do. Okay, now you guys have a new album coming out? You know it. Okay, what, what's a title? We're recording it, and it, it, the title is not new. Okay, and how's it going to sound? We're not giving out the title right now. But we're talking about the, the new sound is happening right now. So we'd been in L.A. for a couple months. We had a bunch of new songs we wanted to record, and through a connection, we got to record at the Beastie Boys G-Sun Studios in Glendale. No, that was really, really conducive to our style, because it was just that huge room, all playing together at the same time, being in a circle, really connecting. I need a reason, reason to understand. I need a reason, cause I know this can be what you meant. You had your time with me. Now go where you want to be. I've had my time with you. But what am I going to do? First day of tour. We're heading up to Santa Cruz today. Yeah. We're packing up. You excited? Um. Uh, yeah, of course. It's always fun to go on tour. Ah. Uh, the years go by fast, but the days go so slow. How do you feel about touring? It's fun. Um, it's great, you know, you get to play every night, and it's it's my job, so. Be yourself, Frank. <laughs> I'm being myself. That's what I tell people when they ask me questions like that. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the van. Like, how many people fit in it? Comfortably, six is what you'd want to tour with as a maximum. I'm almost going to argue that six isn't uncomfortable because that means somebody has to sleep on the floor. Sure, so five. So five, I'd say, is comfortable. Six is somewhat comfortable. Seven is going to be burning your ass. But we have how many? But we have, and we have eight. Tomorrow we're going to Baltimore, right? Yeah, that'll be a real rocker. What are we doing tonight? I think we're going to go to New York City. Where are we going to stay? I don't know. So these guys are just gonna tear down, and we're gonna set up. It's gonna be horrible, and then they'll, th and then all the kids will be able to just, they'll be in the middle of watching Rancid when we start, <laughs> and then, and then like about halfway through our set, they'll be able to go over to the daddy's <laughs> stage. <laughs> so there will be probably, I'm let's, I'm gonna guess four people. I'm gonna be optimistic. I'm gonna say 13 kids are gonna watch. Zero. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I would like to introduce for you, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, direct to you today from Hollywood, California, the 
the best rock band in this fine country. Yes! Ladies and gentlemen, the Siren Six! I loved going to Siren Six shows. The unity of the black clothes, and it felt like a, a statement, a movement. You never knew, like during the live show, if you were gonna make it through, if Frank's keyboard was gonna fall, like Nate was always breaking strings, and it was just like really crazy. JC, JC was like, I was always scared that he was gonna fall off, or like break something, or crash in, or break the neck of his bass. The connecting of the songs, I think, is extremely important. We would often kind of go into these little dub jams, and then John would be saying, like, the new sound. This song is the new sound! The new sounds of the Siren Six! Yeah, can we eat sometime today? Park, why don't you park right there? I have a bug in my shirt. <laughs> the best thing about Wawa is that they make a generic brand of iced tea that's extremely cheap. They make a Over here, brand of you've got this stuff. It's Actually, it's not as cheap as it usually is. Well, that's 79 cents. We've got something very interesting to show you. It's called Scrapple. What do you think that is? The ingredients are pork stock, pork, Pork livers, pork skins, yellow cornmeal, pork hearts, pork tongue, whole wheat flour, buckwheat flour, salt, wheat flour, spices, dextrose, flavoring, and pork. So disgusting, I, w I have to have it. The name of the EP is the Young and Professional EP. And this song is called Young and Professional. It was a good show, but I'd say, don't you think, Jeff, that 50% of the audience loved us and 50% of the audience hated us, but yet they all paid to get in and watch our whole set? Oh, yeah. And then 0.001%, the skinhead tough guy, uh, flicked a cigarette at, at Nate. Yes. So some guy threw a cigarette at you last night? Yes, and spit at me three or four times. Really? Yeah. What'd you do about that? I, um, it was really funny because we were singing Young and Professional. And the lyrics are, nothing can stop us now. And I thought it was really quite appropriate at the time. So I, I was staring right at him while I was singing it, and I was giving him some, uh, some tongue licks, like that kind of stuff. I think our style was a bit confrontational. The all black, the eye makeup, the black hair dye that was kind of stylistically offensive to some people that were more used to maybe seeing baggy shorts and baseball hats. Ska in general was a very niche thing, but it had its own way that you could fit into it. And we were niche to the niche, you know? We were a subculture to a subculture. Having been in the ska scene for three or more years prior to joining the Siren Six, I knew the scene these like middle-aged sleazy dudes who were enjoying misogyny in all of its forms. 
sound guys will very often like ignore me. I get a lot of, you know, you're with the band? And I'll be like, no, I'm in the band. And they almost don't believe me. It was really important to us to have something to rebel against and almost to be struggling against. I think it was a very key part of our mindset. But the article in Scatastrophe created a lot of bad blood. We were being vocal in that interview about how East Coast bands were sexist. Desmond Decker had a song, UNITY, yeah. Unity, you know, and to me that meant everyone. I mean, ska was a great platform for like that kind of movement. I was appalled at some of those East Coast bands using this platform of unity and inclusiveness, basically using it for the purposes of the exact opposite. When we went to Tulsa and we went to the Warp Tour and the rumor was the p were there and they wanted to beat Nate up and I was proud. <laughs> You guys had performed this song called Kill Your Idol, and it was really intense and had really great meaning and behind it, um, which I don't think a lot of people realize that you guys were a very socially conscious band. Those that we look up to are never as great as they seem. They've got problems of their own. They've got problems of their own. Kill Your Idol was originally about rape, yeah. Someone I knew had been raped at a very young age. She was 10 years old. She was raped by her 16-year-old cousin. I was deeply affected by the relationship and that person and was horrified that anything like that could, you know, happen to a person. Wanted to know more about her story and the story of other people. So I said, kill your idol. Kill your idol Kill your idol Kill your idol That breakdown of Kill Your Idol was a very important part of the set. We would break it down and I'd get real intense. And that probably is kind of influenced by the doors. That kind of vibe that you're as a band, you're really behind the singer in a, in, in a very intense way. Nate, during Kill Your Idol, he was saying all these things that, that we didn't hear. You know, you didn't hear like these kind of pro-woman, you know, every, every six seconds a woman gets raped. I think that was part of his patter at that time and that was really kind of mind-blowing for me. Just because just because, just because it don't hurt no more, it doesn't mean it never happens. Die! Die! Okay, you have an old album out. It's called Voice with a Built-in Promise. With a built -in promise. It's on yes. Kingpin Records. Can be found Kingpin. on Tower Records, probably. probably one of the most important ever made. And wow. Neat. Possibly one of the most important records ever made. And it's and it and it's just starting to get its popularity going on. Great right album. Now, so go buy it, people. It was weird because we were definitely full of ourselves, but it seems like the way we were full of ourselves was slightly different than then you would consider the traditional, hey, I'm gonna move to LA and be famous kind of thing. Maybe we're even maybe more full of ourselves in a sense that we thought, it, we kind of had a sense that there was kind of a larger mission. There was definitely more at stake, you know, and you could sense it. We were striving so much for homogeneity, certainly like in our stage presence, we're all in black. I had short hair at the time, like everybody else. And I think that was absolutely reflected in also the the dynamics between us as people. We had such a thing with each other, you know, it was a pretty exclusive idea, like a club of six, you know? You know, it's something that Fishbone really talked about a lot, this kind of brotherhood happening on stage between the musicians. As long as we get along, you know, I, I love everybody in the band very much, and 
I wanted I wanted to stay that way. I think we'll be together for a while. Like I just don't think like there's any other bands out there that are as tight knit as, as we are as people. I want us to be um, a, a force in popular culture for the next decade, the zeros or whatever you're gonna whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be um, songwriters and hopefully. Uh, we're definitely performers, always be performers, but hopefully we can uh, reduce the stress performing takes on your body. Look at this bruise. Wait, is it on this arm? Is there a huge bruise? I have a huge bruise. Where did it go? Maybe it was dirt. What's the problem? No, it was a huge bruise from playing. I had this huge black mark. Maybe yeah. it's on my back or something. Where is it? Well, anyways, I had I looked in the mirror today. There's this huge bruise on me. I don't know. Well, anyways, reduce the stress of touring in the road. I do have one. So the idea for making a Siren Six video was proposed, and I talked to John, and he introduced me to the passion of Joan of Arc. So then I got the idea of having this whole video shot in like a stark white space. I figured, you know, this is the future and the Siren Six are like renegade rock stars and like their message is, is too much for the oppressive futuristic government to handle so they've they've sentenced the Siren Six to death. <laughs> ask you at all about the record companies or that we're looking at right now yeah you don't tell me which ones but tell me the process sort of um yeah see it's kind of a mystery to us right now I'm learning a lot like every day we learn a lot and um you know you've heard all that stuff you know that people screw you and stuff and we're kind of trying to think about that I was very surprised that it was such a struggle and I don't know if that's what ultimately led to some of the breakdown. The stuff that I liked. Oh shit, we're on video. It's He's not on. Videos. Yeah, it is. I see the light blinking. Do you want me to turn it off? Wow, that's a nice no, car. Right. You can keep yeah. it on. But I don't want to keep you from getting real, so I'd rather turn it off than do that. Nah, the moment's over. That's right, don't worry about it. Too fast. You spoiled that one. Don't worry about it. Way to go. All right. What do you see for the future of the future? I don't know, right now things can only get better. I mean, things seem to be going really well. We're playing great shows. People seem to be really into our stuff. I just want to be on tour forever. I see us being around for a very long time. I want to be around for a very long time. I don't know. It, it's hard to say whether or not I want us to stick together forever. I'd kind of like to settle down a little bit and not, uh, not move around so much. John wants to move to New York City. And that's that's pretty important to me. Um, I'm working on that right now, trying to get the band to New York. I don't know. I, I think we're a very frustrating group of, of individuals to, to sort of get to know and relate to. And I, I just, we're just trying to make people uh, understand what what we're trying to do. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> babbling. Okay. Yeah. The one thing that I thought ever in the back of my mind might be a hindrance is just an unfortunate alignment with, with a, a, a trend, which was like Scott. It was pretty well known that Scott was lame throughout our career. Which put us in a very interesting position. In an effort to move away from Ska, the Siren Six were teamed up with the English producer Andy Metcalf, who played in the Soft Boys and Squeeze. The band was asked to record a cover for a Pixies tribute album, and while they were in the studio, they also re recorded an old song called One Sided. We are so tired of this one sided relationship, took us for granted, and everybody knows it. You know your child is with your politics. You run your mouth up, making everybody sick. 
we were trying to somehow transition into pop. We started questioning our musical choices. The role of the horns was kind of in question. We really weren't able to change the sound, yet still hang on to what the band was. It's a function of how our obsession with style was so important, because once that was questioned, we weren't able to keep it together. I'm not aware of when Mara left or how she left, only that it came as a surprise. When John left and moved, it was a huge, decision for him. You know, it was a, it was like leaving a family. I'm sure it was, as of any band, frustration of like going at it so hard for so many years and like spending all of your time and energy and focusing on that and making really big sacrifices. We just didn't get the record deal as fast as we thought we would get it. We should have. I think theoretically it could have happened and we were probably kind of close, but being close is very, very different. <laughs> Well, I don't know what the deal was. Like, we, we did a bunch of showcases. We took a lot of lunches. I know that. The surprising thing not about the Siren Six is, is thinking back on it, how quickly everything kind of happened and then dissolved. And Hollywood corrupted us. You know, I think Hollywood totally corrupted it. You know, it is going from being the big fish in the small pond to, okay, now let's see how we do in the ocean and getting a little lost. Sometimes I look back at those days and I think, you know, the, the world just wasn't ready for us. But I think the truth is probably we weren't ready <laughs> for the world or for anything, you know? In 1999, Frank, Nate, JC, and Jeff continued on as the Siren Six, playing shows with Phantom Planet and Cara's Flowers, who would soon become Maroon 5. Then JC left. I remember being crushed, actually, when JC quit. That was the end of the band, because then we started Big City Rock. Look who returned on bass, Tim from Stinkfish. The four of them moved into a one-bedroom apartment, which was named the Power Station. Yeah, it was great when Tim came back. We started playing shows, made a video, and then Maroon 5 offered us an opening spot on their tour, and Tim didn't want to leave his day job for a month. And while we argued about it, Maroon 5 offered the spot to someone else. At the same time, word spread that Jason Schwartzman had left Phantom Planet, and they were looking for a new drummer. With Jason leaving the band, you all had to replace your drummer pretty fast. Uh, what was it about Jeff that you liked? We've known. This guy right here. Well, I just... He's, uh, he's stunning, isn't he? Woo! He's very good looking. Come on. Sean's I'll... only saying that because we look a lot alike. No, it's, <laughs> it's just the glasses. Uh, we've, we've known him for five years. He, he came to town uh, in, a, in a band called The Siren Six that sort of sounded like Elvis Costello and, uh, I don't know, Fugazi or something. Yeah. And uh, wow. he, 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 wowed, he wowed me from day one, and, and I've, I've always wanted to be in a band with the guy. Wow. It's like a perfect love That's affair. That's awesome. If the dream is powerful enough within your own heart, it's not it's not about like, oh, things didn't didn't go right, so I guess I'll just go back home. It's like, no, how am I gonna try again? At long last, Nate and Frank got a record deal with Big City Rock. In 2005, they relocated to New York City to record their debut for Atlantic Records. Everybody in the, in the band is, is reaching a, a new chapter in their lives, you know. Frank's going to school. Everybody's up to something.
to uh, success. Past, present. Past, present. Now, Past, present. Cheers. Cheers. And most of all, ska. Yes. <laughs>
talking Oh, you still keep talking Hey, 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 yeah, 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 yeah,